Welcome to the Portland Interior Designer Spotlight Series, featuring in-depth interviews with some of Portland's most influential and innovative interior designers. These public conversations, sponsored by Sealoom and PortlandArchitecture.com, are a nexus for Portland's vibrant design community, an opportunity for casual networking, and the perfect place to hear about the next big thing in Portland design. Now, please join us at Sealoom's beautiful ceiling showroom in the heart of Portland's Eastside Industrial District for Portland Interior Designer Spotlight. For this first event, we were thrilled to partner up with Brian Libby from Portland Architecture to bring you uh, a series of events, the Portland Interior Designer Spotlight Series. And tonight, we're very proud to have with us Andy Hess, whose work is well known throughout Portland and beyond. Andy was responsible for designing the interiors of Ava Jeans, Salt and Straws Portland and LA locations, Hawk Hawk owner Andy Ricker's personal residence, the Commodore Hotel in Astoria, Stumptown Coffee's New York Outpost, and most recently, Small Tea in Coral Gables, Florida. Joining Andy is noted architecture and design writer and founder of PortlandArchitecture.com, Brian Libby. And Brian's writing frequently appears in the New York Times, Dwell Magazine, Metropolis, Architect Magazine, and Contract Design and Eco Structure. <coughs> His blog, Portland Architecture, is the city's most prominent source for news and in-depth coverage of projects and issues encompassing the regional design community. And without further delay, please allow me to introduce Andy Hess and Brian Libby. Thanks very much to uh, Noah and Salim for hosting this, and it's great to see all of you here. And um, uh, when we started talking about possibly doing a series, uh, I, I had been involved in something similar a couple of years ago. Uh, it designed within Reach for a couple of years called uh, Designs on Portland, and, and mostly talked with architects uh, in the community and that sort of thing. Um, and when I imagine doing something like this again, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I like the idea of talking with interior designers because I feel like I write about their work all the time, but I don't really know as many, personally, as many interior designers in Portland as I ought to or as I'd like to. And um, uh, so that was kind of part of my motivation for this series. I, I make my living um, mostly writing, or at least half of what I do is writing for different home magazines. And so um, in, in that process, uh, I had uh, become aware of Andy's work over the past few years, and um, it was 100% no-brainer when we started to think about who we wanted to have first, and um, I've been a fan of Andy's work for a while. I don't remember exactly where and how I met you. It might have been at least involving the 937 project. We'll get into some projects, of course. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there's so much I really like about should I say her work or your work? Say me. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> as you can see, I've got a handy little cheat sheet here, and uh, I, I jotted down some of the things that I that I that I'm a fan of. Um, uh, uh, a, a, a lovely fusion of often vintage and modern and traditional pieces that sort of becomes something greater than the sum of their parts, and uh, I feel like there's always some kind of interesting bold display of, of some kind of artwork and, and often like incorporation of, of nature and, and vegetation in interesting ways. And um, I feel like I'm always looking at, at all kinds of interesting patterns, whether it's whether it's the floor or let's say the ceiling tile, um, you know, just all kinds of interesting pattern making going on. And so I feel like my eye is always sort of led in a bunch of different directions in, 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 in which I say, you know, meaning it in the best way possible. And um, I feel like there's something kind of cinematic happening. Um, I, I used to, years and years ago, I used to write about movies and I was trying to think if there were any directors or any kind of combination of directors that the work reminded me of and I have no idea. I thought there were, there were little moments sometimes, uh, no, but there are little moments sometimes that remind me of like a Wes Anderson movie in, in that, um, this, you know, it, this kind of narrative and uh, this attention to detail, it's sort of like a reverence for sort of traditional and classic style. Um, but I also, um, this may not be quite accurate, but there was actually 
also a Stanley Kubrick quality to me. Something about the symmetry and, and the, the, the balance and everything, and, and um, maybe it's just like the photographs. So. But there's something else too, and, and I couldn't really think of the right movie for this third part, but there's a kind of, like, um, a kind of sense of energy and fun and, and sexiness as well. Like I thought maybe like Barbarella or something. Something it would have to be sort of like a teensy bit space age kind of um, and mixed in as well. So um, um, so Andy um, He didn't he didn't like those aren't pre approved so <laughs> uh, I saw some head nodding about the Wes Anderson part though so maybe that maybe I'm not completely out there. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you first kind of uh, about your background and uh, um, I wonder like if you were someone that kind of knew all along what your path was or, or if it was more of a kind of roundabout pathway to, to becoming an interior designer. Like, um, you know, what, what, what were you like as a kid or, or was it obvious that? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I want to say uh, thank you all for coming. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. And it's really nice that half of you are just silhouettes to me also. <laughs> <laughs> but you look great. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, design. Um, I think as a young age, I was very creative and my, my parents are very encouraging of that as like an artist and um, we have the story that we tell about that I would kind of squirrel away into my room and like work on little projects and stuff. And, and there was one time when they came home and found this lovely like blue line of oil paint on the carpet like leading back to my room. <laughs> um, but so, so that was kind of my first foray into interior design. Right. Like, when that oil paint was on the carpet. But, you like raging furniture and, uh, <laughs> and stuff like that. I actually don't remember. I mean, we used to put, to, put together like uh, art installations and stuff like that. But um, you know, after, after high school, I, um, I actually um, kind of got into studying uh, the history of furniture and learned to weld. A lovely gentleman taught me, um, who's now my husband. Um, but um, kind of starting with like the materiality of things, and I started to study the history of furniture, and then um, kind of discovered that uh, interior design was a direction that you, that you could pursue, which at the time wasn't like, you know, it wasn't each to TV and interior designers everywhere. So I didn't really um, know about that so much, but. But then you found your way eventually to Merrill Hurst, and, and with, you did some additional study before that too, do I remember right? Or, yeah, well I was studying the history, kind of just started with the history of oh, furniture, right. and, then, and then found the program at Merrill Hurst, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then studied there, and got mm -hmm. a degree in interior design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and then would Skylab have been what came next? Then? Skylab was um, my first internship, so um, <laughs> I discovered them uh, here in town, and I knew that that's who I wanted to work for. So one of the principals that started Skylab was um, a Merrill Hurst graduate, and so I just started stalking her, basically. So And I really hounded her, and they were like, we don't take interns, leave us alone. And then finally, uh, yeah, they let me in, and that kind of evolved into, I was there for four years as head of interiors. Um, and then started my own practice, Osmos, which it's been almost eight years now, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. pretty incredible. And uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Skylab Architecture is without a doubt one of the best and most compelling and interesting and, and unique architecture and design firms in the city. Um, it, I, I believe you worked on one of my favorite Skylab projects as well, which was the Duck for a Restaurant, which is not far from here, but just really immediately turned heads all around, um, not only in Portland, but in also in some national media. And it was just this incredibly fun blend of, uh, of different strains, like it felt a little bit like a classic diner, or I guess West Coast coffee shop, and, and there was all the use of wood, obviously. Um, uh, but then again, there was this sort of um, sense of modernity, or, or, or like a, almost like a disco feel as well. And uh, you know, um, it seems like, even though your work has continued to grow since that, it seems like some of the ingredients for what make your work compelling were, were there to be seen 
in that project? Well, that, that was a, a really interesting experience in that it was really hands-on. I and mean, we were like sanding the logs and like I hung those beads by the fireplace and you know, in the men's restroom, the beaded thing that I hung that. And you know, that's, it's kind of a, it's almost like a privilege when you can actually touch the work that you're, you know, sitting in front of a computer and drawing lines, but to actually like be in the space and be able to manipulate it and control it is, um, it becomes a privilege at a certain point when you're really busy and you have to crank stuff out and deadlines and stuff. That type of thing, I look back like with nostalgia, of, like right. oh, well, hanging those beads. What a wonderful time right. that was. Right. <laughs> and that kind of leads me into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, just uh, yes, to, to get you talking a little bit about your design approach and philosophy. One of the things that always you know, interests me about um, being a, a designer, whether it's an architect or an interior designer or any other number of kinds of designers is, is the different hats that, that end up being worn. And, and I know this is probably true to an extent for all kinds of different jobs, but you know there, there's the sort of meeting with clients and the interfacing with clients, and then there's getting really, really involved in some of the material choices and some of the other collaborators you have. And, uh, and there's really having an eye, you know, maybe I think for some some designers, you know, they, they do well talking with clients or, or something like that, but but some of them, you know, want to, are happiest when they're just by themselves kind of drawing with the plan. So, you know, I'd love to hear just sort of a little bit about um, your your approach and process, like, you know, what it's like if someone were to walk into Osmosis, you know, headquarters, you know, what, what headquarters. You know, <laughs> One of the things that I love about design, interior design, definitely is the privilege, what a privilege it is to be in this profession and to be able to have a creative expression that is like manifested and realized in, in the real world. That's, I think that's an absolutely incredible privilege. Yeah. Um, and, there's, and there's so many facets of it. You know, we do some levels of industrial design, some levels of graphic design. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting, challenging balance of, you know, kind of the aesthetics and the structural components, uh, you know, synthesizing all of the um, consultants, but also then you have, you know, there's, you have a client, because that's how we're doing most of this, uh, which is really, really important to me. And, you know, there's a, there's financial, there's an economic level to it, and there, there's also a, like a psycho, psychology to it as well, and dealing with clients and the balance of their finances and everyone's priorities. So um, I think it's it's just a constant thrill, really. Um, which of those, I, th I think there's a level of each of those that I actually enjoy, and that's how I'm able to like keep doing this and keep the <laughs> focus on it. So do you feel like you like you're you lean towards one versus the other? Like are you you, you mentioned when we were talking before the talk that you're an extrovert, so do you feel like uh, you know, enjoy sort of collaborating with the clients and your other team members or are you more of sort of like a solitary person who needs to kinda of go away and think and, and draw or Well for me, interior design is about people and it's what we're touching every day and it's, you know, whether it's on a big company level, it's a big corporation, or ultimately these are spaces that people are going to inhabit and that is, um, that's definitely a driver for me because I really enjoy kind of the, the psychology of that, like, you know, be it commercial or residential, just like digging into like, what are we really trying to accomplish here and making decisions based out of that exploration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like uh, there's a kind of narrative, or there's inherent to interior design, there's a kind of storytelling quality as well. And, and uh, I, I would imagine, I know for a lot of interior designers, you know, you can, when you can start to sort of imagine uh, a story that goes with the space, um, even if it's just an imaginary story, um, then that can be helpful in the process. Do you feel like you, when you're starting to imagine a space, like whether it's one of the residential or the retail, Places you've done, do you, are you sort of daydreaming about you know who's there or you know how much is like a, a kind of narrative story? How much of it is story? daydreaming? How much do you think of what you do as kind of? 
of like almost like an imaginary movie set. Well, yeah, I know that's interesting. Um, you know, right now where Osmos is from, um, from like a project and client um, outlook, we're able to kind of be a little bit more selective about the directions that we're going with our projects and we're able to kind of like sort through what's a good fit. You know, when you're first starting up, you're like, I can make that work, I can make that work, and I'm gonna do everything and do what it makes. And, and you know, I've had a lot of time kind of putting that time in. Um, but really, the, the, the key for me is the process for every single project that we take the same approach of process, which is looking at a concept. Now maybe that's specific, like residential, it's like looking at, this is your home, this is your life, let's like visualize that and communicate that. Where with commercial, it gets a little bit looser. I mean, you have potentially like the corporate culture that you're, you're working towards, how they see themselves, um, how they want to see themselves. There's, there's always this kind of core set of parameters that you're building upon. So, um, and then in between that is the daydreaming of how I want people to perceive them or, you know, or how I think they really want to be perceived. Or, you know, there's that level of like, or something where I see like, oh, this is something I really want to explore and I need to get them on board so we can go down this road together. And, um, you know, so there's, there's kind of like the little challenges in that, but really it's like stepping away and getting that big picture that's really, really fun for me. And uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about clients as well, because you've had some really talented and interesting ones. You know, like I can think of the work you've done for Stumptown, and uh, you know, there's Dwayne Sorensen behind that company who's really interesting. And it seems like you know some of the places you uh, or some of the people you've worked with, there's a they these are already people who have um, a sense of sophistication or a sense of you know where a, a vision for where they want to go. You know, like. Um, how did you sort of get more successful? You know, it, 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 it's an opportunity to kind of work with amazing people. And, you know, I, I wonder if you could talk about sort of the relationship you've been able to have with some of these clients who are kind of doing amazing things. Like, you know, Stumptown is getting attention all over the world. And, and, uh, and there are, you know, a lot of other kind of visionaries or interesting people, you know, like you're working. I, um, a more recent project for you is, for example, like Small T, I believe in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, and I know less about that company, but mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about you know that interaction. Some of the people you've uh, had a chance to talk with, and, and also, of course, every client is different. So right. you know, I imagine that's part of what your job is to sort yeah. of get a sense of you know, is this someone who's wants to be really involved in all the details, or this is somebody who wants me to kind of run with it. Right. And yet you've also been able to keep a kind of connecting thread amongst all your projects that feel like Osmos as well. Yeah, I would say that definitely goes back to, because you know you never really know what you're getting yourself into. You know, I, th I think that's the nature of, you know, <laughs> humankind. Um, but you know, especially having like visionary clients that have built things from the ground up. Um, you know, there's a lot of like strong personalities and, and how we work through that. It's really like this developing this syn synthesis where you're, you're, when you're saying something, when I'm saying like modern, my client's thinking the same thing when I say that. So how do you get to that point? Um, that, that's really where the process comes in and developing a common story um, and giving time to that. So if I'm coming to my client trying to convince them of something that I know maybe they're, they're not going um, you know, to be on board with right away, I need to have a solid backing for that. Not just like, uh, oh, it's blue, you know, we like blue or we hate blue, but blue would be really great with that couch or, you know, it's like for me, um, I'm not convinced of that. So it's really me convincing myself a lot of times, why am I making this decision? Am I choosing this light fixture because I've seen it over and over again and people respond to it? Or am I choosing this because it ties back to a core focus? So in really in dealing with um, in developing a relationship with clients, it really I really encourage even my residential clients, like let's go through this process and then it really, you know, it's like it's like the dating phase where we're really getting to know each other and like 
and so that I know when I'm speaking to them, they're understanding what I, you know, what I'm saying. Right. So, right. So it's an interesting. That's kind of the process of how we get to, you know, like a base ground zero, and then build off of yeah. that. And then trust. I mean, trust is huge. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, and if I'm not confident in what I'm doing, they're not going to trust mm -hmm. me to make those crazy decisions mm -hmm. with their money. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like the best clients you've had tended to be more involved in, in regular communication with you, or do you feel like you've benefited more when you have? a little bit more leeway. It's really a range because parameters are, are fantastic. It's it's really a good thing to have parameters and you're pretty much always going to have some parameters. But I have had clients that have like no budget, everything I say goes. Uh -huh. And those are the points where you can kind of take those like artistic um, leaps and push technique and explore things a little bit further when you don't have those all of those parameters. Right. So those are going to be like our artistic exercises a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, parameters are welcome in reality. So mm -hmm. you know, it's the pragmatic side of it. And, and speaking about the art is, is something I was kind of excited to ask you about as well. It, because even though I look at your work and I think that it's it's cohesive, that it's kind of the sum of its parts are greater. There are these kind of moments where you you um, have been able to sort of work with artists and. and and create a sort of element of surprise. Like, um, for example, um, oh, you and I worked together recently on an article I wrote for Grey Magazine that's um, going to be coming out in the days ahead. I think it's the cover, actually. And it's this house in. Uh, uh, um, it's this house in. in um, it says yes, Mr. Grey says yes. <laughs> it's this this house, this 1920s house in in West Hills, Portland, and. Uh, um, I remember uh, getting the sense of being uh, stopped in my tracks when I came in because there was this amazing stained glass and it was fun talking with you and learning about more about that. It turns out that um, the person who designed the stained glass was someone who was in one of my favorite band, rock bands, you know, and, uh, and uh, is also uh, uh, you know, someone uh, that, that you go back with. And, and so, you know, even aside from that specific, specific uh, project, you know, um, it, it had this, you know, wonderful stained glass, kind of modern and, and not just modern as you came in and almost, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I, I wanted to ask you just in general about, you know, your approach to kind of working with artists. And it seems like there's a, there's a role that that great art can play for you that is more than just like something hanging on the wall. Um, but at, at a moment to kind of stop and, and create a moment of unexpectedness, or like I think in that same project, like as you go up the stairway, it kind of you make like a, a left turn as you go up the stairway, and there's this moment where a corner of the ceiling is occupied by this this artwork. And um, when I had to write the article, I didn't know what to call it. I, I think I called it something silly, like a, a cluster of frightened origami or something. But uh, you know, just wait till you see the article. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, we really, it, it's really a focus and, and kind of just like a personal thing that I enjoy. Oh, we have to, are you leaving, John? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> John helped organize all of this. He's an excellent job. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, no, so I really um, pursue collaborations and the, the wonderful thing about them, especially with artists, is I have to let go of something, you know, like I'm used to, I can control it all and like perfectly coordinate it all. But when you're opening up for collaboration and saying like, you know, you're, especially with respect to, um, you know, kind of the artistic realm, it's like, I, I can't put too many parameters on this or I'm gonna yeah. ruin it. So that element of surprise for me is a really interesting, um, Kind of discovery, and it's, it's. I like to, like, I say, uh, everyone, once a year, I try to do something that really scares me. So, I, you know, sometimes working with an artist is that thing, which is like crank, but I also, <laughs> I, <laughs> I give it away, you know, because you can't really control it. 
So I think that that is a really exciting, and it's actually something that I've been challenging myself in more, which is where you know the line between design and art is a really interesting one. I've been reading um, a lot of kind of anthology conversations about this, so that I can really understand it, because it you know in my youth. Um, I really was an artist, and I called myself an artist, and I was fully like confident of it. And then I went to design school, and I kind of learned the skill set, and learned how I could like compartmentalize everything, OCD it, and then kind of lost that confidence in in that like looseness. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. it's something that I really value and seek out and yeah. try to cultivate in our work for sure. And I feel like I sense that in the work and the projects as well that. That um, you you don't even though there's this incredible attention to detail at the same time it doesn't feel like everything is programmed like uh, um, whether it's you know the art or or some of the ways you've been able to incorporate nature as well. Um, but we know exactly where it's all going. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, maybe you could tell us. Uh, but we want to have a little bit of time to talk about this past project or two. But I wanted to be sure and ask you first. Um, you know, what are you what are you working on now, and, and what might we what might we see, uh, you know, from your office in uh, months ahead or, or longer? You know, you know what's got what what you're kind of you know deep in the middle of right now. Right. Yeah. Right now we're working on a tasting room for house spirits, um, which is a really exciting. You know, it's just kind of every time I can, you know. We get a new client that's outside the realm of something we've already explored. It's like so exciting because it's like learning a whole new world. It's like I, I'll sing the song. <laughs> um, no, it's really it really is that though because I you know I I'm not a distiller. I don't you know I don't have those skills. I don't know how that all works. And then you know how the industry of that, how they market it, how they want to be perceived, and the growth. You know, so that's something we're working on right now with them. Um, that's going to be on Water Avenue in Stark. I think they were, our signs will be up today or tomorrow. Um, so we're working on that with them and potentially some other projects with that. We have a, a really strong relationship with Salt and Straw. We did um, an LA shop for them. We're doing a few more for them um, this upcoming summer. So and there's different. We're we're allowed to do kind of different iterations on the theme, which is really really fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have some kind of smaller uh, restaurant projects in, in town coming up. And mm -hmm. I always forget something. What am I forgetting? <laughs> oh, instrument. <laughs> <laughs> I always forget, I like the hugest project we're working on, yeah. <laughs> so Holst um, is building a beautiful building for our instrument, which is a digital branding agency um, that's on North Williams, and we've been privileged to be doing all of the ff &E for that project, which has just been fantastic. So that'll be coming out here mm -hmm. in sometime soon. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Hopefully that's great, soon. Yeah, that's, that's great. And um, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time asking about a couple of past projects. I think a, a natural place to start is Ava Jeans because it seems like that's a, that's a, do, do you feel like that's a project that people have really made a lot of notice of? I mean, I know it, it, a big, you know, ingredient, pun intended, is the food as well. Um, but, you know, I feel like I, I hear people all over, town, all over town wanting to go there and, and um, you know, um, what do you, what do you feel like, you were able to accomplish there that that people are, um, you know, get it, that that is resonating with people. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, that that project, um, that's a it's an interesting one because really, like when I started Osmos um, eight years ago, I really thought like that Portland was going to be a really hard city to do a restaurant, like an elevated kind of detailed restaurant like that in. Mm -hmm. Because we were so successful and with like the do-it-yourself, like some of my favorite restaurants are not designed by design interior designers. And it's something I value about them actually, like it's not over design. Um, so that that project was really kind of like a, an amazing, you know, the, an amazing opportunity in combination of a lot of things uh -huh. where I was really given free reign. I was doing a lot of traveling and research for that as well. And then, um, yeah, you know, the thing that I'm the most pleased about that project is peop that people come back to me and tell me that when they when they enter that restaurant, they feel like they've kind of been transported mm -hmm. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like it has that um, transportive uh, yeah. feeling, and um, that's. 
that's um, that's fantastic. You know, it feels sort of European somehow, and, and it feels like it it um, you know is very evocative of a of a traditional restaurant and has some of that style. Um, but it also becomes something more as well. I don't, I'm not quite sure if it's the lighting or certain surfaces. I can't or tell you. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> And lighting is something that I feel like I also come back to a fair amount. Um, you know, like in, in the small team project, for example, um, you know, it's it's very seemingly kind of intimate space, but but um, the the jars and the bottles are really kind of just glowing within the space and, and really given this kind of spotlight again in a sort of cinematic way. Like and in the pictures, it's it's sort of maybe a little bit more dark, dark, but a little bit you know ambient space. And you get a sense of the product sort of glowing. Yeah, well, I have, I, I, I worked for a lighting designer for, for a while, actually. I was in school managing an apartment complex, working for a lighting designer part-time and working for Skylab the rest of the time, um, and picked up a lot uh, during that, just learning about lighting product, and so that's something that um, is really, really in, important to us. That The Small T Project actually is in Interior Design uh, Magazine right now. They gave us a page on it which is um, quite an honor. Um, and that project is in Coral Gables, which is like a, a sub suburban town of Miami. Mm -hmm. Town, maybe not town, city. Um, and it's like, you know, it's like 100 degrees there most of the time. And it was a, it was a uh, bank. It was a bank with like one window. And the window's like kind of tinted. So the, uh, the exploration of light was like so crucial in that, and that was a really fun challenge to make it have these kind of level, levels of depth and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. be loungy and comfortable, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, is there, are there things that you would like to do that you haven't had a chance to yet? Like you have an interesting mix of, of retail and restaurants and residential. Um, are, like as you look ahead, say over the next five or 10 years, are there either types of projects or, or some other type of challenge that is out there for you? Maybe it's doing more work in other cities or, or ramping up to a bigger scale or, or you know, it would be perfectly cool to just sort of keep doing exactly what you're doing too. It's amazing. The daydreaming. Yeah, yes. yeah. Like, um, what other and more daydreaming? What, what would you like? Where, you know, if you could sort of, if there was like a genie to grant thing yes. for you. There you know, is. Um, yes. Um, um, well, you know, our our focus, my focus with Osmos is to keep it small, and I've gotten, um, you know, counsel and advice in that direction because there's always that next project that like is, there's that tempting level to like just get a little bit bigger, just get a little bit bigger, and we want to stay small so that we can stay um, you know, involved in all of the aspects, keep our process, you know, stay true to our process, and, um, and also collaborate. So we've worked with a lot of the key architecture firms in, in Portland, and then once, once we work out of state, we find an architect of record and establish that relationship and value them for their skill set, and we have our skill set. Just building projects based on, um, building your team based on the project. Um, and you know, definitely, we're definitely looking towards um, doing kind of more boutique design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This last December, I went to the New York Times Luxury Conference. Actually, uh -huh. Uh -huh. that was my one thing I do that I do to scare myself. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually have people like, "You're an interior designer, and you're from Portland. What are you doing here?" Like, literally, say that to me. But it was really like, you know, I mean, that's an interesting realm. Um, that we that I'm really intrigued and in is kind of the luxury market as far as like retail boutiques. It's a good that I think that's definitely something I want to do mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we can add that to the list next year. Yeah. Got your works. Yes. And like, are you uh, are you like a real workaholic? Like, are you someone who has a hard time sort of sitting still, or do you are you? Like I a, stand. I have a standing desk. Yeah. <laughs> There's no sitting. No, no treadmill desk. Yeah. <laughs> Just in the morning. Yeah. Um, workaholic. I don't know. When you have your own business and you have you know employees and eight projects at a time, um, I don't know. I don't actually think of myself as a workaholic. I really enjoy what I do, and I make it. it you know, I do um, focus on spending time with my family and my husband. <laughs> Lucky him. <laughs> um, 
But I, I, you know, I, but it's been eight years now. We've kind of hit the, a stride, mm -hmm. and I mean, two years ago, this is not the case that yeah. we were nonstop. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. You get the project, mm -hmm. and then you figure out how to do it. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. So. And and you mentioned going to this uh, event in Miami, and uh, you know, it, it, it seems like uh, you know we have to sort of think of when we're thinking about the context of your work. Obviously, um, being of and from Portland is. Is part of that, and and you know part of what's interesting as I've gotten to know you is some sometimes your stories about you know the traveling you've done and that sort of thing. Like I remember you told me you, you got your you learned to drive in Egypt, to, for example. Yes. You know, um, and I know you spent I, I I remember you I think spent some time in Hong Kong as well. But also you know this is a kind of moment of some sort that is happening in Portland in these years. More attention for the city culturally or, or urbanistically than ever before. So I would imagine, especially you know, when you go outside of Portland, you you uh, that's sort of the frame of reference people have in regard about you. Besides your own work, is that you're part of you know, that you're from Portland and, and it's you know kind of an exciting time to be from Portland. So, but there's also like a whole set of what they think that is, right? Mm -hmm. So like my my uh, the small tea plant in Miami, we had just finished um, Stumptown in New York in the West Village. And that's a very, I'd say that's a pretty Portland project infused with West Village, and that's where it was supposed to be. So they were like, oh, Portland, yeah, Portland's cool, like come to Miami and bring Portland to Miami. But that like, just, it really, so it's, it's actually something that's like, kind of draws people in because of the Portland hype. But then, you know, we're not trying to push a Portland aesthetic, like I want to get back to the process and everything I'm pounding you guys over the head with. Um, but, you know, that's, so like when you look at small tea, you know, it's got a little Miami in it, you know, and, and it's good because, because it should, that's yeah. where it is, and that's yeah. where it's growing, and, and um, you know, so that's, that's a, it's a, it's a challenge, it's kind of a two, a double-edged sword mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. thing in a way, you know? yeah. Yeah. it's a catch, but then it's also like we kind of have to fight it a little bit, you yeah. know, which yeah. is good, it's good. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it seems a lot of people feel that way about the, the sort of, Place that Portland has in like the, the the broader culture or the zeitgeist now that that um, there's something about it that's exciting, but there's also moments where we all kind of roll our eyes a little bit as well. Yeah. <laughs> well I'm native, so maybe I've just been rolling my eyes for a really long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you just can't take yourself too seriously. I think that's the most important thing, especially in design. It's mm -hmm. like this is not you know this is what I do. This is not. Who I am. This is an expression of, mm -hmm. of that, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's really that's really important to have a handle on. Right, right, and of course, also the personality of a place is not just about sort of like the cliches or, or things that happen in a skit on television, but there are also things about our culture, you know, professionally that are interesting as well. Not just uh, that we use a lot of wood or, or something like that, but I think, for example, like uh, architects tell me a lot that, that this is a more sincerely collaborative place amongst designers and artists than a lot of places they work and it's a little bit less cutthroat um, and, and that sort of thing. Like, uh, do you feel that's the case? Yeah, that's just interesting. I mean, I just working here and kind of taking that ethos to all of our projects, I, I think that we just have that built in as our is our the osmos corporate culture or whatever uh -huh. you want to call it that. But just because that's, that's what I value and and I think also having a hands-on, those are definitely Portland things for sure. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I don't want to show up on a job site in stilettos and point at something, you know? Like, actually, on Stumptown, West 8th, the project, we had some snags, it was running on. I spent two nights there until three in the morning sanding the cabinets <laughs> because I wanted this patina. <laughs> and they were like, you know, we're a union and we're going home now, yeah. so. Yeah. It's less of you young kids out there that it's, all, it's not all glamorous. <laughs> I loved it. I loved every minute of that standing. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. um, well, I think we're going to start to wind down here, but I wonder is there any question that might happen from the audience? I, I see there seems to be one person nodding and smiling and waving okay, enthusiastically, so we would love to hear your question. On that point that you just made, um, I often travel about and get that thing about, oh, you're from Portland. And actually, one of my hometowns is Miami, so I can kind of feel it. Like, yeah. Isn't it more of a mindset and a sensibility that we bring than an actual aesthetic or choice of materials? 
It really, you know, it, it really depends. That's what I yeah. would say. You, you know, <coughs> we're all, I believe, whatever our professions here, we're all interdisciplinary. And you'll start recognizing I'm a Maryland first grad too. Oh, same way. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that's what we bring to the world that's so important at this particular time. Because we've been a, a, a cosmopolitan a hatching place mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. decades. Yeah, there's but something finally to Finally coming up. Yeah. yeah. So it's, thank you for It's all of the that. mold that's hatching. <laughs> <laughs>